Okay, so welcome. And uh, the first speaker of today is Adam Antebi from the Max Planck Institute, Max Planck Institute in Cologne. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. So, good morning. It's really great to, to be here. This is a fantastic meeting. Um, I guess you guys didn't go out for cocktails last night, so that's why you're here. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this really fantastic meeting. I think it's one of the few that brings together basic research, medical research, um, biotech, and AI. And, and I think um, it's growing every year, so it's, it's really great to see. Yeah. So today I want to tell you a tale of old and new love. And that is our studies on diapause. So diapause is an amazing phenomena uh, that has really given rise to some fundamental insights into longevity and rejuvenation. And so I think we can all agree that diet has a huge impact on animal health span and lifespan. And it's known that diet restriction and intermittent fasting can extend the lifespan of model systems uh, and have benefits in human health. And it's thought to delay the aging process and perhaps even stimulate rejuvenation uh, within stem cell pools. Yet the mechanisms underlying this are poorly understood. Now diapause is an extreme uh, state of fasting-induced uh, quiescence and longevity in which animals are arrested in a hypometabolic state. They're highly resistant to stress and they're geared towards survival. It's however reversible and um, what's quite remarkable is upon recovery from diapause, they rejuvenate all their tissues. It's mostly known among invertebrates, but also vertebrate species can enter into diapause. For example, embryonic diapause when they experience a nutrient deprivation in utero. And also, um, after birth, they can go into stages of torpor or hibernation, which are also states of somatic endurance. Even species such as us that ha don't have explicit states of diapause can nevertheless respond to fasting and refeeding regimens, which remodels metabolism. And metabolism, as we heard uh, from Tom, can remodel cellular fate. And so I like to think of ourselves as mosaics of diapause uh, inactive and uh, non-diapause active cells. And that this balance of quiescence and activation is essential for stem cell longevity, tissue homeostasis, and uh, animal lifespan. So, um, so the worm C. elegans is really a master of diapause. Under normal replete conditions, when food is plentiful, they'll develop uh, very rapidly within three days to adult and then live another three weeks. But when they encounter adverse environments, they can arrest at these different diapause stages, the most famous of which is the, uh, the third larval stage, dower diapause. These animals can live for months. Uh, and they survive without food, yet upon refeeding, they resume development and, and mature into normal adults with normal lifespan. So there's this enormous plasticity, and this plasticity is governed by the so-called DAF genes, which were discovered by Don Riddle and Patrice Albert. And I would argue that the biology of aging field really came out of their studies on this dour uh, signaling pathway, for example, the, the most famous of which is DAF2 and H1, which were worked on by Cynthia Kenyon and and, and, and Johnson, um, these encode components of the, of the insulin pathway, uh, which we now know can extend life's, whoops, sorry about that. Which we now know can extend the lifespan, not only of worms, but also in, in, in higher metazoans. And so it's really led to key insights into metazoan longevity. Our, Studies in this area focused on vitamin D-like signaling, the DAF12 signaling pathway, and its role is, a, is the ultimate regulator of the dower diapause and the control of stem cell quiescence and activation during larval life and uh, adult lifespan within a, the germline uh, longevity pathway. But this is uh, what I call the old love, and I'm more interested in telling you about the new love. And the new love is an adult reproductive diapause, or ARD. And this is another diapause stage that the animals go into. Um, and we think this is a really important stage because um, it can identify genes and mechanisms that could, mechanisms that could promote rejuvenation in an adult animal. 
And it's very, really very poorly understood. And one of the reasons for this is it's very hard to get a large quantity of such animals. They just form sporadically on starved out plates. And so uh, Berger Garris set about to, to optimize this. And she found that fasting during the third larval stage causes a quantitative conversion of animals that then enter this adult reproductive diapause where they have a fully formed uh, reproductive system, but they're about the tenth the size of an ad libitum fed animal, and they're sleeping here in a, in a quiescent state. And they're remarkably long lived. They live three to four times longer than an ad libitum fed worm, so they're fasting for 80 or 90 days. And during this time, um, they, 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 they preserve their, uh, their soma, but then things start to go, go bad. Uh, and then when you refeed them, however, they completely regenerate all their tissues, including their germ lines, which re reactivate. And this gives rise to progeny. Even out to 60 days, they can produce broods of 50 animals. So this is incredible plasticity and remarkable uh, conservation of, of activity, uh, even out to, to such long time frames. And this is regeneration not only of the germ line, but also of the soma. So for example, uh, during ARD, uh, neurites can um, accrue gaps, and these are repaired upon refeeding. So there's this remarkable process of regeneration. There's also a remarkable uh, remodeling of metabolism, including um, mitochondria. They go into a hypometabolic state where oxygen con consumption drops, uh, and there's low levels of mitochondria, DNA, uh, but upon refeeding, oxygen c consumption resumes, and mitochondrial DNA are, is massively produced. So there's massive mitochondrial biogenesis. Here's an ARD animal. Here's a recovered animal. Um, I challenge any bear to come out of hibernation with muscle fibers that look like this. So it's really, I think, a very exciting model of regeneration. And if you're not convinced by this physiology, perhaps this transcriptomology will convince you. Um, so if you look at the changes in the transcriptome with ad libitum aging, uh, and this is work done by Kazuto. Um, there are genes that go down and genes that go up with ad libitum aging, but upon, uh, if you put animals into ARD and recover them, there's a, a very much a reversal, so blue becomes red and red becomes blue, of this transcriptome, and this is shown in this inverse correlation plot. So we interpret this to mean that there's a vast remodeling of the transcriptome, uh, which appears to be a rejuvenatory process. And Importantly, this rejuvenatory process isn't just focused on the fasting phase, but also the refeeding phase. And we, we think this is an important concept to get across. It, fasting is good, but so is refeeding. This is really important. So what, what are the activities that are responsible for mediating ARD? And through genetic screens, um, we identified TFEB, which we heard about from several different groups yesterday, as a master regulator of ARD. So it's a conserved regulator of autophagy and lysosome biogenesis in, in, in worms. It's important for uh, multiple longevity pathways and also for innate immune signaling. Uh, we found that it was very important for ARD survivorship and recovery. And so, for example, normally wild-type animals will live 80 days, but TFEM mutants live a mere eight days. There's a complete collapse. And this is fairly specific because under ad libitum conditions, there's only about a 10% drop in, in viability, and it's part of a signaling mechanism because you can see within two hours after ARD induction, TFEB goes into the nucleus, and very rapidly there's a, a dysregulation of metabolism. For example, uh, these TFEB mutants in worms, this is HLH30, uh, these TFEB mutants spend down their fat very rapidly. They lose fat, uh, they shrink in size, and their germline stem cells, instead of being compacted and quiescent, are expanded and look active. Yet, uh, these, these stem cells are not um, very functional since when you refeed animals, these TFEB mutants are unable to produce progeny. And it's very specific to the adult reproductive diapause because uh, TFEB mutants have no impact on the dower diapause. They can enter it, they can survive it, and recover from it. So that raises the question, what are, what are the activities that are uh, that TFEB is regulating that's so important. And we heard about autophagy and lysosome biogenesis. It turns out these don't seem to have a very big impact on survivorship in ARD. And so we decided to do genetic screen and in an unbiased way to find out what activities were important. And so uh, this is work by Jenny. Um, and this was really, I think, a clever screen 
I have to say. So Tifa mutants only live this eight to 10 days and she mutagenized uh, animals and looked for survivors that can live 20 days or more and produce progeny. And what's, what the, the beauty of the screen is actually it's a direct screen for longevity. And as proof of principle, uh, what we got out of the screen are mutations in the insulin IGF receptor, DAF2. So, uh, so DAF2 and, and insulin signaling is very important for lifespan control. And we also got mutations in various components of the TGF beta signaling pathway, as well as uh, cyclic GMP signaling, which actually impinges upon both uh, TGF beta and insulin IGF signaling. And so this just shows you some of the data. So TFEB mutants live this long, and in, in, in blue is mutations in TGIF beta receptor type 1 or DAF1 in the worm, and that extends the survivorship. Similarly, DAF2 insulin receptor mutants extend survivorship. Um, and these suppressors also uh, restore a more normal body size, and they also restore progeny production, going from TFEB mutants from zero now almost to the level back to wild type. And at this point, we decided to focus more on TJ beta signaling because it had been uh, relatively less explored in the context of longevity than, than TJ beta, uh, than um, insulin signaling. And so, um, so if you look at the transcriptome, uh, what you see there is just like TJ beta signaling has a complete reversal of physiologic phenotype, we also see a, very much a reversal of the transcriptome. As you can see, there's an inverse correlation. And, and those, those genes that are upregulated by t, uh, loss of TFEB, but then downregulated by loss of TGF beta signaling include genes involved in innate immune signaling, ribogenesis, and DNA damage. Uh, and conversely, genes that are uh, downregulated in TFEB mutants, but then upregulated again in, uh, by TGF, loss of TGF beta signaling include those involved in lipid, uh, glucose, and uh, and mitochondrial metabolism. So uh, TFEB mutants disrupt the normal metabolic regulation. It's restored by uh, downregulating TGF beta signaling. And so the, it, the genetics then suggests that TFEB normally downregulates TGF beta signaling to promote uh, organismal and stem cell quiescence. And so we decided to test this idea of regulation by using reporter constructs and looking in the live worm uh, to see what was going on. And uh, this next slide summarizes a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of beautiful work by Tim Noninger, who's here, who has a poster, uh, and, and it gave rise to this model that goes as following. Uh, under ARD uh, conditions, um, when the animals are fasting, the, the lack of food cues um, is detected by these sensory neurons, and TFEB goes into the nucleus of these sensory neurons where it downregulates TGIF beta signaling. And TGIF beta is actually expressed solely within these neurons, uh, within the worm, and not in other um, tissues of the body. And this results in a downregulation of TGIF beta signaling throughout the body, including the germ stem cell niche. Uh, and downstream from that, it results in a, a, an inhibition of notch signaling, the downregulation of which is the critical regulator of germ cell uh, quiescence and activation. And so downregulation of notch results in germ stem cell quiescence. And then conversely, upon refeeding, uh, these sensory neurons <clears throat> detect food, <clears throat> TFEB goes out of the nucleus, the TGF beta signaling pathway goes on, notch goes on, the germ stem cells are active, and you have reproductive uh, competence. Uh, wh what's really interesting about this uh, pathway in this model is it's, it's really uh, a cell non-autonomous sy systemic regulation of the, the, uh, the, the stem cell pool, uh, and it's linking the nutrient supply uh, to this regulation. So what we think is happening in TFEB mutants, remarkably, is that under the ARD condition, they're trying to enact a refeeding program. That is, they turn on TGIF beta and notch signaling uh, in different tissues throughout the body. Um, so for example, in the ASI neurons, um, uh, the TGIF beta is expressed, in the niche, the TGF beta receptor is upregulated, uh, and in the, um, also in the niche, notch signaling is up, uh, inappropriately upregulated, as well as within the germline uh, stem cells themselves. And so, this inappropriate activation of TGF beta and notch, we think, uh, is really dysfunctional. These are not functional active cells. And, 
and it, it, there's somewhere between activation and quiescence, and they're really sort of uncommitted, and this leads to all sorts of problems, this disconnect between the nutrient supply and growth signaling. So uh, beyond TGIF beta and NOTCH, there's also a profound dysregulation of, of cellular physiology. So I mentioned earlier that TFEB mutants have expanded uh, nucleoli and nuclear size, um, and that's repaired by loss of TGIF beta signaling. Upon refeeding, um, there's a really cool remodeling of the niche where uh, the niche sends out these long processes that expand the zone of, of germ stem cell activation. Uh, so this is seen in wild type, but in TIFA mutants, this, this uh, niche remodeling is completely blunted, but partially restored by downregulating regulating beta signaling. And then finally, um, during refeeding, uh, the stem cells, the germ stem cells go into cell cycle again. TFEB mutants completely fail in this, but uh, downregulation of TGIF beta signaling partially restores such cell cycle entry. So, um, so summarizing, the loss of TFEB results in an upregulation of TGIF beta and not signaling and, and altered tissue homeostasis, including enlarged nucleolar morphology. Uh, an irreversible cell cycle arrest. Um, and this really got us thinking uh, and scratching our heads and it reminded us a lot of senescent cell phenotypes. Now, in C. elegans, you know, we don't really do a whole lot of, of cell senescent studies because we're usually focusing on demography. Are the animals alive or dead? How long do they live? Um, but we decided to explore this idea of, of a, a mammalian cellular senescence model in a full organism in the worm. And so, um, and so we started to look at some of these other features of cellular senescence in this whole animal model. And first we could show um, from the transcriptome data that there's altered immune signaling similar to SASP and also elevated DNA damage response. For example, uh, they accrue a RAD51 foci. Um, and again, this is repaired by loss of TGIF beta signaling. They uh, have a premature aging phenotype as evidenced by an acceleration of a transcriptomic clock repaired by, again, uh, reduced TGIF beta signaling. And finally, um, they even have elevated levels of SA beta gal, again, repaired and restored by lowering TGIF beta signaling. And so, um, so we think this, this normal functional role of TFEB is to really work as a switch between the, the fasting uh, quiescent mode and the refeeding activation mode, and that what happens in the mutants is there's this disconnect between the nutrient supply and the growth signaling, and this leads to dysregulated metabolism uh, and cellular damage in the senescent phenotype. Um, and, and so we think that this, this form of senescence, which is really a metabolic uh, 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 dysfunction, might be much more prevalent than we realize in, in human aging, and uh, we're very interested to explore this idea. So the other thing that gets us exciting is that these molecules are conserved in evolution and play similar roles. So uh, the Brené lab showed that TFEB uh, plays an important role in neural stem cell quiescence and TGIF beta signaling has been long known to play a role in stem cell dynamics. Our work brings these two pathways together into a unified pathway and we think that, that um, this should be explored more fully in other contexts other than neural stem cells. Uh, we also excited because uh, we think this is very similar, actually conceptually, to parabiosis experiments where there's systemic regulation of the stem cell pool. And indeed, um, some of the molecules that have been identified through such experiments include, include those in, uh, that are TGIF beta or uh, TGIF beta related molecules. So, uh, beyond just homology, though, we, we wondered about. Uh, physiology and, and ask the question, what about the role of these molecules in regulating mammalian forms of diapause? And here we had the great fortune to, to, to collaborate with Manuel Serrano and Valentina Ramponi, and they were studying embryonic and cancer diapause. So uh, cancer diapause is actually really important and interesting. This is when cancer cells go into quiescence to evade immune surveillance and, and the effects of uh, chemotherapy. And so this diapause can be induced by treating cells with this mTOR PI3 kinase inhibitor, INC-128, and uh, this mimics the cellular diapause. And <clears throat> what they found in, in CRISPR screens is that uh, TFEB is actually 
very much required for, for survivorship of these uh, embryonic stem cells that have been put into such a diapause. If you knock it out, uh, sur uh, survivorship goes down. And similarly, um, if you knock down TFEB in these cancer diapause cells, survivorship also decreases. And, it, and finally, if you look at these uh, human melanoma cells induced into diapause, they induce TFEB and they also induce the TGF beta signaling pathway. So very much like worms, um, TFEB is required for survivorship in the diapause and there's this intimate connection to, to TGF beta signaling. Here, the, the difference being that uh, we think that in, in mammals, TFEB, TFEB is turning on TGF beta signaling rather than being, turn, uh, being turning off. Um, but this never the, nevertheless results in the same phenotype, which is stem cell quiescence, because in worms, the wiring of the TGF beta pathway is opposite with respect to whether the cells are growing or, or not. So, but the concept, I think, is very much the same. So then I hope I've convinced you that diapause is really an amazing phenomenon that we can learn a lot about uh, longevity and rejuvenation, and that this TFEB TGF beta axis is a primordial regulator of stem cell uh, longevity and diapause across evolution, uh, that this axis links the nutrients to growth signaling through a systemic mechanism and thereby prevents macromolecular damage uh, and senescence under nutrient stress. And fasting and refeeding induces metabolic flexibility uh, and cellular plasticity that's required for reprogramming, and this goes awry with aging. And we think that the study of ARD as a model system through the power of the genetics and genomics, we can really unravel novel uh, mechanisms that regulate adult rejuvenation and lifespan. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank the people who did the work, uh, the major work here, Tim Berg at Jenny and Kazuto, and these other folks are collaborators or sources of funding my fantastic and fun lab for all the good times and, and great science, uh, and you for your attention. Many thanks. Thanks for uh, that uh, great talk. We have time for one question. Oh, I see. Come on. Thank you. Great talk, Adam. I was wondering, you mentioned senescence, but worms are postmitotic. Uh, I had two questions about that. First, do you see what you, would, what you call senescence there also in normally aged worms? And second, how would you define senescence? Yeah, yeah. I, that, so, so if you asked me five years ago, you know, can we study stem cell longevity and senescence in the worm, I'd say you're crazy. You're, you're studying the wrong animal. But what, what, what we've done by linking this to diapause and, and recovery, we can study senescence in the germ... Uh, in the germline stem cell lineage, which is the only stem cell pool in the adult animal. So, and, and the senescence, as far as we know, much of it is happening within those cells. I think the only phenotype that uh, we haven't really ascribed specifically to the germline stem cells is the SA beta gal, which seems to be distributed everywhere. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's it, really the next step is to try to parse out what, what uh, what cells are most important along that whole march from nutrient to stem cell regulation dynamics. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.